Hi, everyone. Thanks to Neil, and I'm so glad there are still some people left. Um, <laughs> we'll start with something easy. Uh, I would like you to imagine that I'm inviting you on a trip around the world. My guess is the first thing you'll think about is packing, so like different clothes, power outlets, visas, currencies, in other words, a lot of work. And preparation doesn't even end there. Once you arrive at your destination, you need to follow the local laws, customs, social practices. So what often happens is when companies go global and start their own journey around the world, they turn out to be one of those sloppy last-minute packers. And they find themselves in a country with the wrong currency, or even worse, with no visa and not able to enter. My job is to help companies pack better and do localization better, so they can succeed on their global journey. My name is Christina, and I'm the localization lead at Skyscanner. As Sunil said, and as some of you uh, have used it, I know we're a global company that helps travelers find inspiration, plan, and book trips. What you might not know, though, is that as of this week, we have a new logo, new font, new colors, new vision. And um, as a business, we operate in over 200 markets and 35 languages. My team helps Skyscanner product teams and not only product, build products that are relevant for all markets and for all of our users, no matter where they're from and what language they speak. And today I'll share three main examples of challenges we've had and challenges that other global businesses face and how uh, we can solve them together. Before we start, uh, how many of you here work for a product or a service that is available in more than one language? Great. So keep your head up, hand up. Uh, if you are involved in the localization process. Amazing. More than I thought, still very few. It was a tricky question because it's my firm belief that localization is everyone's responsibility. No matter what role is, role is, in one way or another, everyone is involved in it, benefits from it, or is impacted by it. And in my experience and my time in the industry, I've talked to dozens of localization experts from some of the biggest brands. Uber, Spotify, Tinder, GoPro, SurveyMonkey, you name it. And everyone I've talked to sees localization as enabler. Enabling teams build products that are culturally relevant for all markets, creating better user experience by adapting the product for all languages, and if executed successfully, enabling faster time to market. So this is what we, the localization experts, believe to be our biggest value and biggest contribution. And sadly, this is not how others see us. Instead, we are often seen as human Google translators. We just receive words, we somehow miraculously process them, and just ship them back. And this simplified perception of localization couldn't be any further from the truth. Our job is not just ship you words. The ultimate goal of localization is to help build products that help and delight all users, no matter where they're from. And let me just show you like, a similar analogy. I think we have writers in the audience, do we? Great. <laughs> so imagine you're a writer. You're asked to work on a new feature. It has been built, design's finished. And surprise, someone has even written the copy for you. All you can do is just review it. You cannot make any changes if it doesn't align with the company tone of voice, if it's inconsistent with other features or products. All you can do is just proofread. Or you're a designer, ask again to work on a feature, and this is all you can do. Just fill in the colors. So neither the writer nor the designer can bring the value they can towards building a successful product. And neither can your localization team if they're at the very end of the process and if their hands are tight. My mission today is to show you the value localization teams build, bring, how you can work closer together, and more importantly, what happens if you don't. Localization teams must have a seat at the table and must be at the beginning of the product life cycle. The success of your global product depends on your collaboration with them. Through the examples that I will look at, I will show the impact that poor localization collaboration can have on your product, on the user experience, and the design. And as in every true collaboration, all sides and all 
teams have actions and responsibilities they're accountable for. In these examples, I will see and look what product and localization teams can do to make this collaboration better and how ultimately they can build better products. So let's start with one of my favorite examples. Um, we'll look at the product uh, side first and how culture is important. We know how each language and culture are different. We've heard about stories of uh, cultural miscommunication, challenges, and we've definitely ourselves experienced them. And even more, most of us here come from non-English speaking countries. And yet, when building products, we suddenly forget that. We forget that what works in English doesn't work in other languages. So this is a screenshot of uh, a cookie banner we worked on at Skyscanner. We've seen hundreds of <laughs> cookie banners all over the internet. So the UX designer decided to use this somewhat playful illustration of cookies to make it less boring. And while working together with the writer, the UX writer raised the concern, potentially, this image and this analogy and play on words might not work for all other languages. So they came to ask, us, we did an investigation, and they turned out to be right. 15 out of the 35 languages we translated into, this was not going to work for. Um, do we have Turkish speaker in the audience? I think we do for sure. Yes. <laughs> Can you tell us what do you call cookie in Turkish, the computer settings? And what does it mean in English? Are you sure? <laughs> You're ruining my talk here. <laughs> Think because you are using that probably use a lot in English. Any other Turkish speakers? <laughs> um, well, as far as I know, I checked with others. The word used is nuts. No? Okay, well. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I know that a lot of times they use it. So as happens often, some, some users that are more maybe conversed in English or use international products, often they would use the English word. But oftentimes, there is an actual local word for that. Supposedly, in Turkish, that's nuts. So if you were a Turkish user, that's what you would have seen. Sky kind of uses nuts, and then those cookies there. And obviously, that makes no sense to you. Or if you were a Chinese user, this is what you might have seen. And no, they don't call the cookies potatoes. But what the Chinese translator told us was that this doesn't really look like a cookie. It looks like potato to them. So that was feedback for the UX designer, who wasn't <laughs> very happy with it. But I suggest looking at translators as the first users of your product, and translation as a first sort of user testing. For us, this example was a successful uh, collaboration with the UX writers. They were the ones that brought us in at the beginning of this, and we didn't have to finalize this little banner, translate it, make it available, and then to hear from our users what we did wrong. So by getting involved in the process, and we were able to do that by building a network of localization ambassadors. An ambassador is someone that has experienced the benefit of working with you and will advocate on your behalf. And this is exactly what we did. We became allies with the writers, and we turned them into localization champions. After all, we both have the same goal, creating highly efficient and high-quality content. Writers do it in English, and we do it in all other languages. But this isn't always enough to get localization at the beginning. What you as a product manager or designer can do is to take the localization first approach. In the example with the cookie, if localization wasn't brought in there and able to give that input, it would have taken a lot of uh, effort to eventually get it right, and you would have got slower to your market. So getting localization at the beginning ensures all your users get the same experience, culturally relevant product, and faster time to market. Next, we will look at the user experience and uh, how it can be impacted by the poor localization collaboration, how your users will have poor experience and how that will even impact their perception of your brand. Another example of uh, what we've seen at Skyscanner, so it's a screenshot of our app in Arabic. We're looking at two flight results. Uh, looking at the first one, it's a flight that departs at 10.30 and lands at 12.15. What you might know is that Arabic is written from right to left. 
So you maybe see where this is going. Uh, during a user testing, a user very confusedly asked us, how is it possible that my flight departs at 12.15 and lands at 10.30? So obviously, they will never think, oh, that's all right. They didn't do localization well. For a user, your product is broken. And maybe they'll continue with the purchase and the booking, but it will erode their trust in your product and in your service and your brand. It will definitely reduce the chance of them coming back and using it again or recommending it to others. And this is something that could have easily been avoided if we, the localization team, had performed localization testing. Well, usually teams can do once translation is done. There is a linguist often that goes on the device in context, and they will look not only at the quality of the translation per se, but also how it displays and how it functions. And it is easy and straightforward if the localization team has time to do it. That's the biggest challenge, having enough time to translate and then to test it on time for launch. And that lack of time usually is a poor planning on the overall product development cycle. On average, what would you say it takes to build a feature, maybe a small feature, update to one, potentially two to three, four weeks? And do you know how long it takes to localize that feature? Two to three, four days if the localization team is lucky. So we very rarely spend as much time and effort finalizing and building the localized product as we do the English one, the core product. So next time you plan your new feature development, make sure you factor in the localization. Speak to your localization team and see how long they need, but also what else you can support them with so that you ensure that your international users have the same experience as your English-speaking one. Otherwise, you risk not only ruining your user's experience, but also your brand's perception and reputation. And lastly, we'll look at the design and how it can be impacted if localization is not taken in consideration. So this is a very recent example. That's uh, our new app, or how our app looks. Now, um, so we were able to translate and to finalize all the new features of the newly launched app and product until three days prior to launch. We realized that if you're an English speaker, this is what you see. If you're a Brazilian speaker, or if you're a Russian speaker, or if you're 30 of our 35 speakers, you would have seen some form of that. So for English speakers, you'll be able to plan your trip. But if you're Brazilian, you'll be able to plan my maybe next trip, maybe my flight, my hotels, we don't know. What a lot of people don't know is that translation, on average, expands about 30% compared to the English copy. And that's on average, because in our case, we have an expansion of over 100%. And there was absolutely no way for those languages to be able to, say, plan a trip in their own way within the 11 or 13 character limitation. So there are usually a few options in these situations. Best case scenario would be to adapt the design in such a way that whatever length that translation has to fit it there. In this case, apparently, the Android platform didn't allow for that design adaptation here. The other option is to change the English in something that once translated will fit there. And in this case, we didn't necessarily want to do that because our vision and direction as a business is to look more on the trip and like your whole overall trip planning as opposed to just you know flights what we might have been traditionally known as and this is a challenge that every localization team faces and in my role i usually work with the whole business to try to educate and raise awareness how english centric product design or copy can impact the localization and oftentimes i'm faced with understanding and willingness to collaborate but other times I'm sometimes told that by trying to make something work for localization, we're compromising the English product. And I really cannot help but ask, is this truly user-first approach? Or are we prioritizing some users over others? Because English is just another one of your languages that your product might support. Don't treat your international users as second-class citizens. All users are equal. And they all deserve having the same experience and having the same care and attention towards their experience. I envision a world 
where localization experts are part of the product development team. And localization is at the beginning of the product life cycle. My ask of you today is when you go back to work on Monday, go speak to your localization team. See what you can do to help them so they help you build a truly global product. Because this can be a trip of a lifetime, or it could be a total disaster. Building a global product is hard, but you don't have to do it on your own. The localization team can be a trusted partner in going global. Make sure you bring them with you. Thank you.